the Pope's poor English. I have a great difficult. I have a poor English. Yes, yes. This young Korean crowd can't get enough. Stepping out, a spacewalk to launch a pocket-sized satellite and run some experiments. The door debate. Should New York City's poor have their own entrance door? And dropping in, the vacationing president returns briefly to the White House. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, August 18th, 2014. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Pope Francis is back in Rome tonight after making history with his five-day apostolic journey to South Korea. It was his first trip to Asia, and the Pope made a deep impression on the nation of 50 million. We continue our Shine the Light coverage of the Pope in Korea. EWTN News Nightly's Alan Holdren made the trip back to Rome with the Holy Father. Alan, Pope Francis tends to speak very candidly on these return trips. What did he talk with you about? Well, uh, actually, Brian, he talked to us about a, a number of different things, 16 questions, 16 answers. And among them, uh, the most important, perhaps, for American viewers is the fact that he said he wants to go to the United States next year, 2015. He said he'd like to go to three destinations. There'd be Philadelphia for the World Congress of Families. There would be uh, the UN in New York, where Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, has, uh, has invited him, and also Washington, D.C., where President Barack Obama has asked him to come and address Congress. All three of those destinations, he said, were, were ones that he wants to go to. We haven't heard those words from the Pope yet, even though there have been rumors that he might be going. Now, there's also another trip that he spoke about, which we hadn't heard about before, which is uh, Kurdistan. This is to the north of Iraq. This is where Iraqi refugees are fleeing to from the, the violence there, from terrorists in the north of Iraq. Now, uh, I had the chance as a representative of the English-speaking journalists on the flight to ask him the question of whether or not he approves of the U.S. military action and bombing there in Iraq. Penso anche ai cattolici sotto la sua guida. Lei approva di questo bombardamento americano? In questi casi dove c'è una aggressione ingiusta, soltanto posso dire che è lecito fermare l'aggressore ingiusto. Sottolineo il verbo fermare. Non dico bombardare, fare la guerra, fermarlo. I mezzi che con i quali si possono fermare so Pope Francis said that uh, this is one important detail we need to add to this. He said that uh, it's not a unilater unilateral action that should be made. It's not just one nation that should decide how to stop an aggressor. He said it should be a group of nations. He mentioned the United Nations should take care of that. Now, uh, we were there every step of the way in South Korea, these things that might be overshadowed by this papal interview on the flight. Uh, and, and we followed the South Koreans from beginning to end of the, uh, the papal journey to get to know what they were thinking and to hear what they were saying about the Pope. And every indication says that his trip was successful. He's become a phenomenon in the West, attracting so many, even non-believers. But now it's clear the Pope's appeal and message is resonating in this part of Asia. It's been an outpouring of affection from the get-go in this land where the church is thriving despite a history of persecution. It couldn't have come at a better time. The nation is locked in a bitter standoff with their neighbor to the north and grieving after a ferry disaster in April that claimed more than 300 lives. May this tragic event, which has brought all Koreans together in grief, confirm their commitment to work together in solidarity for the common good. Gloria. This visit has brought hope and consolation this weekend, hundreds of thousands turned out to see the Pope beatify 124 martyrs, pillars of the church which was founded by lay converts in the 18th century. His uncanny ability to connect with people has been constantly on display during the five-day visit. Christ 
is knocking at the door of your heart. Whether he's with young people who gathered here from all over Asia, or at a home for people with disabilities, or consoling families of the victims of the ferry sinking, which has set off a firestorm of criticism of the government and demands for an investigation. While his gesture stirred great emotion, the message was pointed, an appeal for peace with North Korea, a call to reject materialism, the result of rapid economic growth here, and a reminder to serve the poor. That has struck a chord here, especially with the young. I want to share the face with the, in, especially the Korean and the Asian youth. I was so happy we can stay the same place at the same time. Yeah, it was really blessed. The Pope uh, like tried to like say the word peace, and then he's really caring about the old and the children. So uh, we hope like a, like a uni uni unification, like you know, united together. So that's why I really, really, yeah, looking forward. <laughs> that desire for peace, a theme of the trip, even extended to China, which has a tense relationship with the Vatican. But Francis expressed a hope for dialogue at the end of his trip. No doubt he hopes the fruits of this visit will be seen there and throughout Asia. So this was Pope Francis' first trip to Asia. Uh, insiders say that he chose South Korea very carefully as a springboard to the rest of the continent. We'll see him going to Sri Lanka and the Philippines next year. All right, Alan, thank you and our team for making that long trip with Pope Francis and sharing that experience with us. A little later, we'll have more from Susie Pinto, who is still in Seoul. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world on this Monday. President Obama has returned to Washington tonight. He interrupted his vacation to meet with his National Security Council on two key issues. Wyatt Goolsby reports from the White House tonight. Wyatt. Brian, late this afternoon, the president addressed the nation, speaking about the two topics of his meetings, both the situation in Iraq as well as the unrest in Ferguson, Missouri. First, on, on Iraq, he says he voiced his concern, but also gave credit to the Kurdish as well as Iraqi military for working together. He says that in combination with support from U.S. airstrikes are proving effective against extremists on the ground. Today, with our support, Iraqi and Kurdish forces took a major step forward by recapturing the largest dam in Iraq near the city of Mosul. The Mosul da uh, dam fell under terrorist control earlier this month and is directly tied to our objective of protecting Americans in Iraq. The president's remarks come after a meeting with members of his National Security Council. They talked about the conflict between militants with the Islamic State and Kurdish forces. The two groups had been battling for the last two weeks over the control of the Mosul Dam, which the president said, if it had burst, would have threatened Baghdad. Kurdish forces are being aided by those airstrikes. And since August 8th, U.S. Central Command has conducted a total of 68 airstrikes in Iraq. The second, the president has also been meeting with the Attorney General Eric Holder about the case of Michael Brown. He is the unarmed 18-year-old who was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri by a police officer. The president said that he didn't want to jump to conclusions or make a judgment call about this case itself because it is still under investigation. But he did make a distinguishing point between the peaceful protesters and those who were committing violence. Let's take a listen to the president on this. Well, I understand the passions and the anger uh, that arise over the death of Michael Brown. Giving in to that anger by looting or carrying guns and even attacking the police only to serves to raise tensions and stir chaos. White House officials and Eric Holder have been in repeated contact with Missouri Governor Jay Nixon and state police as part of their ongoing independent investigation. The members of the administration are also concerned about maintaining peace in the city. There's been violent clashes since the shooting on August 9th. The president also announced today that Eric Holder will go to Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, he will travel there on Wednesday. Uh, to talk with communities there. The president is also scheduled to meet with advisors more about these two topics tomorrow before he returns to Martha's Vineyard to continue his vacation later this week. Brian. Alan uh, Wyatt, I'm sorry, that's uh, Wyatt Goolsby at the White House. We had Alan in Rome earlier. Now, Wyatt mentioned the Missouri governor, Jay Nixon. Uh, he says there will be no curfew tonight in Ferguson. Today, the family of Michael Brown is making a case against the officer who fatally shot the teen. 
After a weekend of some of the fiercest clashes yet, new details about the moments leading up to Michael Brown's death are being released by a pathologist hired by the family. The autopsy shows that Brown was shot twice in the head and four times in the right arm by Officer Darren Wilson. Each bullet entered the front of the body. Preliminary evidence shows the bullets were not fired at close range. Brown family attorneys say taken together, the results should lead to one outcome. This officer should have been arrested. Those things speak for themselves. Why would he be shot in the very top of his head? Six foot four man. Makes no sense. The autopsy was conducted by Michael Baden, a high profile pathologist who testified in the O.J. Simpson and Phil Spector murder trial. There weren't uh, signs of a struggle. All of these uh, gunshot wounds were uh, uh, survivable except for the one in the top of the head that went through the brain. Graphic new video of the aftermath of the shooting appears to show Officer Wilson standing near Brown's body speaking with another officer. The woman who took the video describes what she saw. Officer Darren Wilson to the right, he's just looking over the body, just looking baffled and bewildered of sorts, like trying to explain to the officer what had I just done. Molly Hemingway, senior editor with The Federalist, is here to talk about the latest on this Ferguson violence. So the autopsy showed that this gentleman was shot six times. Some say he had his hands in the air. There's a lot of speculation about this. Where do we go from here? There's been far too much speculation without good information. And the, now that we're starting to get autopsy results, we can begin to sort of think through these things a little bit more impartially. And one of the things that's interesting about the initial autopsy results is that it contradicts some early witness uh, testimony that the victim was fleeing. And in this, uh, what we just saw, the Michael Baden said that it was, that all the wounds were in the front of his body. So this is helpful for us to begin to sort through what happened. What about bringing in the National Guard? Was that necessary? I think it's it's a way of saying that this has the local police have completely failed in their job of local community policing, and I don't really see uh, you know bringing in National Guard as a good way to calm people down who are already upset. And it doesn't help that the police department is mainly white. This is a mainly black community. Are there really some underlying issues that go, that have been there long before this incident? Well, it's certainly true that a white police officer can serve a black community as well as a black uh, police officer can serve a white community. But it's also true that police should come from the community and that, that that's a very important way of building trust between a community and the police who serve them. And what we're seeing and what Ferguson shows is that this is a problem, not just in Ferguson, but in so so many communities throughout the country where there's beginning to be this disconnect between the police and the communities they're supposed to serve. What did you think of the president's comments that we just heard and can he or should he be doing more? Well, I think his comments, what he said was actually quite good and it's kind of unfortunate that he hasn't been able to do more. He's been um, unfortunately a, a divisive president and I think that many people had hoped that on, on uh, these types of issues in particular he might be more helpful. What do you think happens now in this case? Well, hopefully communities will start thinking about uh, the militarization of their local police forces, the importance of having trust between the community and the police, and, um, and also more than anything that people will learn to get along well together and work through these things as well as possible. I went through this quite a few years ago in Cincinnati, a very similar incident, and it did result in some very positive changes. Do you think that we'll see some in Ferguson? I think we'll definitely be seeing changes. I hope that they are positive. All right. Molly Hemingway, we appreciate you being with us from the Federalist. Thanks for joining us. Well, a warrant will not be issued for the arrest of Texas Governor Rick Perry. He faces two felony charges of abuse of power. He will appear before a judge, but that summons to court has not yet been issued. He was indicted Friday for allegedly trying to pressure a district attorney to resign. The indictment states he also promised to withhold money from the state public integrity unit run by the district attorney. This is the first indictment of a sitting governor in Texas since 1917. Former House Minority Leader, that is Majority Leader, Eric Cantor's resignation from Congress takes effect today. He lost Virginia's Republican primary in June to Tea Party aligned candidate Dave Bratt. It was a major upset for Cantor. He was seen as a rising star in the Republican Party. A special election to fill his congressional seat will be held in November. A former U.S. senator who single-handedly tipped the scales of power in Congress died today here in Washington. James Jim Jeffords was 80 years old. He served in Washington for more than 30 years, initially as a Republican from the state of Vermont. 
Now, he switched his party affiliation to independent in 2001, and he caucused and often voted with Democrats. That change actually cost Republicans control of the closely divided Senate. Jeffords said he could not remain in a party that favored tax breaks for the wealthy over full funding of education programs for the disabled. As the Ebola epidemic spreads in West Africa, a new treatment facility has been set up in the Liberian capital, Monrovia. It has more than 50 beds. It is staffed around the clock with local doctors and nurses. In contrast to the doctors who left other medical facilities for fear of contracting Ebola, many of this staff volunteered for the duty. Just before its opening on Sunday, rooms were still being disinfected. The new center is expected to be filled to capacity. More than 30 new cases are discovered in that city every day. The Ebola outbreak has now claimed at least 1,145 lives. Two cosmonauts stepped outside the International Space Station today to handle a few chores in space. The two Russians spent about six and a half hours floating in outer space, launching a tiny satellite just four inches square and weighing barely two pounds. It holds cameras that will aim at Earth. They also installed and retrieved science experiments. Meanwhile, American spacewalks remain on hold until fall so they can get fresh spacesuit batteries on board. Coming up, divided peninsula. Catholicism is booming in South Korea, but stifled in the North. And fighting with valor, helping you to know the Americans who served our nation. Shine the light team coverage of the Pope in Korea. Look at these great pictures. A Korean man in traditional dress as he enters the cathedral for the final papal mass. Seoul is a colorful city, combining the modern with traditional Asian culture. The largest city in South Korea, the first Asian city visited by Pope Francis. EWTN News Nightly producer Susie Pinto has been leading our team on the ground in Seoul, where it's now Tuesday morning. And Susie, before you head home, give us your take on this trip and maybe some of the things that surprised you about it. Brian, this has been an incredible trip to cover. The Pope has surprised us many times along the way, but one of the biggest surprises was to hear him speak in English. He did that in a handful of speeches and homilies, and the more he started to speak, the more comfortable he started to become. He even joked around with the crowd. Take a look. I thank you for your warm welcome. Very warm, eh? Very warm. I have a great difficulty. I have a poor English. Yes, yes. But if you desire, I can to say other things spontaneous. Are you tired? May I go on? No good when I see I gym people who sleep. No, wake up, go, go, go ahead. You are not only a part of the future of the church, you are also a necessary and beloved part of the church present. You are the present of the church. I'll be leaving in a few hours, but I'll see you soon back in D.C. Brian? Thank you, Susie. Sav uh, safe travel to you. And during his trip, the Pope reached out to Asian nations that don't have diplomatic ties with the Vatican. One of those countries is North Korea. The church there did send a congratulations to the Pope when he was elected, but was not represented at the recent Mass in Seoul. Tonight, Paula Hancox takes a closer look at Catholicism in the North. A hero's welcome for Sister Kim. A nun from South Korea arriving in North Korea. State propaganda or genuine religious belief? Visiting first in 2000, Sister Kim says these Catholics in Pyongyang had not seen a nun since the Korean War, 50 years earlier. I thought they could have been fake followers to start with, she says, but when I met them, they were old people who had been religious for a long time. Father John Park also receives a warm welcome, traveling from the south to give mass here for the past 14 years. 
He says these North Koreans are not faking their belief, but the fact that the church is under strict control of the state means there are differences. There are no priests in this country, and confession is out of the question. Confession is one-on-one, -on -one, he says. A South Korean hearing the confession of a North Korean could get us both into trouble. We could be accused of espionage or passing on intelligence. There are a small number of churches in the capital, including this Protestant one, but the United States says North Korea simply gives the appearance of religious freedom. It listed the country as one of the world's worst abusers of the freedom to practice religion. Kenneth Bay, a Korean-American missionary, was sentenced to 15 years hard labor recently. Guilty, Pyongyang says, of trying to overthrow the regime. He's not the only religious man to be arrested in North Korea. Some missionaries and experts believe there is a very small underground church in North Korea. The number of members unknown. Christianity seems to be the most dangerous ideological challenge to the existing regime. The only political and social and ideological force which managed to create a functioning underground network inside North Korea. Paula Hancock's CNN Seoul. The World War II generation had Ali Murphy, one of the war's most honored soldiers, turned movie star, but many of us couldn't name a single hero for America's longest war, the 13-year conflict in Afghanistan, or the war in Iraq, for that matter. Jason Calvey with us now. He's talked to an author who's tried to change that. Brian, yeah, it's all about understanding, putting ourselves in another's boots. We might, we might not know the fear of bullets whizzing by or the threats that a bomb could go off as we walk the road. We might oppose war, but we can still welcome these soldiers home with open arms. The gun at his side replaced by the hand of his daughter. The fatigues and the beard are gone. But for this two-time Bronze Star Medal recipient, the memories of Afghanistan last a lifetime. He died in my arms. Army Lieutenant Colonel Michael Waltz looks back on the ambush that claimed an Afghan ally. Waltz dodged bullets to try to save a sergeant named Sumar. A sergeant that simply wanted a better life for his family. He was determined to have his children go off and be educated and receive a proper education. Now Waltz cares for his own daughter and pays to send Sumar's three girls and three boys to a non-radicalized Afghan school. We had talked a lot about our children. Waltz's story is one of nine in the book Valor. Every single one of them insisted that they were not a hero. Author Mark Lee Greenblatt captured the heroic stories of American service members who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. The media hasn't focused on these stories and told their tales. They're inspirational, amazing individuals. And I think they've gotten lost in the shuffle of the, of the political, the frenzied political debate surrounding the wars. Greenbat learns lessons from story after story of valor. When we kick the table because we can't get the, the Wi-Fi to work, you step back and you think about what these guys have gone through and, and how they held their poise in the face of adversity. But that adversity continues for our men and women in Afghanistan, and now a small number of advisors back in Iraq. The Special Forces commander says he's concerned it's a conflict that may spill over to his daughter's generation. The war doesn't stop whether we stay or go. We are in the midst of an ideological war, just as we were in the midst of the Cold War against communism. And if this is just the opening chapter in a multi-decade conflict with extremism, then we could possibly look for more stories of Valor Brian in the coming years. All right, thank you, Jason Calvi. Up next, poor door debate. One door for the affluent, another for the poor. And one last glimpse of the Pope's visit to South Korea. We appreciate you joining us tonight for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. In the interest of time, we'll save the story on New York City's poor door debate for tomorrow. Until then, I'm Brian Patrick. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, we're going to leave you with just a few last memories of Pope Francis's trip to Korea. Good night, and may God bless you.